someone who works in elite sport and pro sport, certainly we see with athletes over the last two decades, just the lengthening of careers, uh, you know, which touches on the themes of your book, but even more so the, the coaches as well, trying to perform and achieve things in, in midlife that they have never achieved or hang on to, to qualities. So if we can circle back, you mentioned, you know, that midlife period, certain cognitive qualities that are that become more pronounced that we can really kind of lean into. Can you share some of that with us? In our late 40s, early 50s, the two halves of the brain start talking to one another like never before. Generally, they work in opposition. Um, and the divisions are not what most people think. It's the left sees like very particular, the right sees the big picture, that sort of stuff. But they come together in our 50s and start working together like never before. And finally, the brain starts to recruit like underutilized re regions, right? By the time you're 50, regions that are going to be used all the time are pretty well mapped out in the brain. The brain goes, oh, you never learned to play a musical instrument. You got like this little portion of your temporal lobe. Let's use it to store X, Y, or Z or learn X, Y, or Z kind of thing. Yep. When this starts happening, the results are whole new levels of intelligence, three kinds of intelligence that are really not accessible before start coming online. Short version is black and white thinking goes away. We start to realize everything's sort of a shaded gray, More relativistic, thing, layered, yeah. call it. right? We get multi-perspectival thinking so we can see around things, right? Right. And, and, and finally, big picture thinking, right? We start to really be able to see the forest through the trees and at whole new levels. This unlocks new levels of creativity and not just low level sort of like creativity, divergent thinking outside the box, far flung connections between ideas, the hardest part of creativity to train people in really critical in our society, really hard to train, start current line. And then we get whole new levels of empathy and wisdom, um, both of which are very distinct neurobiological traits we could talk more about, but this is a huge boost and like measurable changes in intelligence, in creativity and all that stuff. Now, you don't get to hang on to you have to you have to earn work, them and then you have to do stuff to hang on to them for sure so it's sort of like it's really really cool you get a superpower but like not for free yeah it's interesting in the book you know you talk about critical thinking and problem solving creativity cooperation communication collaboration all these things that are now really highly valued in, in today's uh you know world and a big part of that is also probably how the ego also starts to quiet to your point of being able to kind of see things and the context of things and the wisdom. Um, maybe can you speak a little bit of that, of that uh, wisdom and empathy and, and the, the parts of the brain that are getting uh, lit up there? Empathy is a lot of different systems, spindle cells, mirror neurons, there's motor programs, there's a lot going on, but what, the, what starts to shift. So the temporal parietal junction where the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe come together that is a portion of the brain that does perspective, physical perspective. Like, am I facing front? Am I facing sideways? Mm -hmm. And uh, mental perspective, right? As my mind open or closed. In fact, when we have out-of-body experiences, it's this part of the brain that's going haywire, which is to say an out-of-body experience is a radical shift in perspective. That's what's actually going on. Yep. Usually brought on by critical life-threatening situations where your brain goes oh crap, normal perspective isn't going to save your butt. What happens if we shift it radically out here and let you see this sort of top-down view of the simulation kind of thing? Interesting. Um, and so this portion of the brain kind of one per it gets very active and when perspective widens, so like that's what's going on. Wisdom is really cool. And from a peak performance aging perspective, you have to sort of stop and talk a little bit about, about a, a different topic before going into wisdom. So wisdom... Think of like sort of intelligence or skill acquisition as, you know, facts and techniques. Wisdom is like social intelligence writ large and emotional mm -hmm. intelligence writ large. And it's like, it's also the meta rules of how systems may work, right? Not the individual rules, but like the meta rules about systems yep. around systems and things like that. All that stuff is wisdom. Now, it turns out both expertise and wisdom are really important traits from a peak performance aging perspective because they are, big words ahead, danger, neuroprotective against cognitive decline. What nice. that means is if we develop expertise, mastery, and wisdom, we can stave off cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, and dementia. And the reason is this. 
Alzheimer's cognitive decline and dementia are predominantly diseases of the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex is really powerful part of the brain. It's also evolutionarily the newest portion of the brain, and it's the most vulnerable to cognitive decline. We rarely, like the brain stem rarely erodes. You may have a stroke or something down there, but it doesn't sort of erode. The prefrontal cortex will erode over time. And if you want to stop that erosion, you want to birth new neurons and you want really dense neural networks. What forms the densest neural networks across the prefrontal cortex? Expertise and wisdom. And because of a principle in neuroscience known as another crazy word, degeneracy, which is not anything like what it sounds like. Degeneracy literally means the brain never figures out one way to do something. It'll figure out a dozen. So your brain never really repeats the same pattern with all the exact same neurons twice. It will always recruit new areas and whatever. And in this way, we don't ever just like master a skill one way. We master, we surround the Multiple skill ways. from every possible anger. It's this widely redundant network with lots of backed up synapses and neurons and thus impervious to cognitive decline. This was, by the way, funny. So a lot of this work got done in the 80s when they started, and 90s when they were trying to answer a question, which is they discovered that Ronald Reagan had severe Alzheimer's in the second term of his presidency, really severe Alzheimer's. So the question was, okay, how the hell did he govern the country? Like how yeah. would you have to do the toughest job in the world with advanced Alzheimer's? That doesn't make any sense. And they discovered what's known as a cognitive reserve, which is basically wisdom and expertise. In fact, we now know, thanks to Yakov Stern at Columbia, that every quote unquote leisure activity you learn in the second half of your life. So learning to draw, learning to play a musical instrument, speak a foreign language, read a new book, blah, blah, blah. You gain an additional 8% protection against cognitive decline. It's an 8% increase in what's known as your cognitive reserve. So this, like we, we have sort of really great data on like the use it or lose it portion of our mental skills. That's essentially what we're talking about here, right? There's there's yep. other stuff going on and we can extend this conversation a million different ways, but that's the broad overview of what we're talking about.